Good morning, colleagues. My name is Jim Trodden. I am an OIM. It's always good to get that part over. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, but before I move on, I would like to thank Finn and Mark for setting up the tone for what should prove to be an excellent day. I've never seen so many people, so many passionate people, committed to earnestly talking about improvements. Also, you may have noticed that I am Scottish, so you guys all speak English better than I do. Bear with me. My short talk is, who do you think you're talking to? When we think about the workforce, we think about that as an entity, as a homogenous mass, and believe me, it's not, and I think it's a mistake. In fact, if you shut your eyes and think about anyway, if you think about OIM, what does that call to mind? What's the first image you get when you think about drilling? I'd just like to talk a little bit about them too. So, who do you think you're talking to? I'll just carry on talking about the, uh, the role of the offshore installation manager, the OIM. And by the way, that's the only abbreviation or acronym that I'm going to use uh, in this short talk. Also, I'm not going to have any technical language. But the function of the OIM, the role came about after a disaster in 1965, where the rig CGM suffered a catastrophic structural failure. Thirteen men died. And as a result of the inquiry, there was a recommendation that there should be a master, a person of unquestioned authority on board these rigs. And that was how the OIM came about. And I think the word master here is very significant because by and large, the oil companies went out and they recruited persons from the Navy, from the British Royal Navy, from the Merchant Navy. And they were masters. They were people who were used to command and control hierarchies. They were used to uh, expecting respect through their office rather than gaining respect. Now, it would be wrong for me to consign a whole generation of OIMs to being autocratic and arrogant, but uh, I didn't meet many who were otherwise. I think the kindest word that I could use to collectively describe them is remote. They didn't seem to have any function in the day-to-day -day business of the installation. The, uh, how can I put this? When you went to the OIM's office, it was only because you had done something very, very good or something very, very bad. And believe me, either way, it was an uncomfortable experience. So, the role has evolved, and I'd like to touch on that as we go through. Thank you. Right, so who do you think you're talking to? Offshore installation manager, we've talked about him. That's me, by the way, in the red jacket out in the park. The workforce, yeah. Like I say, the term the workforce, it's like an entity. It doesn't really appeal to me. The workforce is a community that lives on an island in the middle of the sea. It is a society. It's a fairly simple, structured society. But like all societies, it has the pillars and the paragons at one end and the malcontents and the miscreants at the other end. And in the middle, a lot of reasonable people. <coughs> the basis of a sound society, zero. This to me is significant. This is the number of murders that have been committed by workers in the North Sea on installations in the British sector since the start of exploration and production. Surely that is the basis of a sound society, eh? Who else could say that? There have been much fisticuffs and disagreements, but no murders. That's a good place to build on. 46 years. This is another significant figure for me. 46 years is the average age gap on my installation every day. I've got 19-year-old apprentices, 65-year-old stewardess. So really, you could be working with your grandmother. Indeed, you could be working with your granddaughter because we've got some apprentices uh, who are fantastic systems and instrument techs who are girls. How do you communicate to that broad spectrum, that broad band? Have you thought about that? 
Or do you just have this image of your standard offshore worker? I tend to dwell a lot on the, the apprentices. Uh, they are mentored. They are me their, their mentors are hand-picked for their, their technical skills and their attitudes and work ethics. I also see the apprentices as future leaders. So they are always introduced to bigger picture stuff. Platform safety committee meetings, leadership meetings, environmental meetings, anything that will give these young people a good view of the, the bigger business. And also, while their minds are fresh, I don't really want them tainted by poor attitudes and potential cynicism from some of the older hands. So 46 years. But I'll guarantee you, I know all these people in the picture, none of them is 19, none of them is 65. Component parts. Chevron employees. These people are exclusively the operations and maintenance team. These are the people who, are, who bear the biggest responsibilities for process containment. Yep. Their fundamental business to me is to maintain Chevron standards, to always display Chevron behaviours, and to do things in that sort of way, that sort of Chevron way. This is the group that has the highest potential to affect catastrophe. This is the group that is charged with, I believe the term in Denmark is safing equipment for the use of, for the work of other people, third parties, isolations, de-isolations, plant startups, shutdowns, the control of bypassing critical equipment and so on. Next, I have core contractors, people like the deck crew who are in charge of all lifting on the installation, a very high risk activity. And these guys do it very professionally. Uh, the other core contractors are the construction crew who work on small projects adjacent to live plant. Our uh, catering crew, facilities crew. They are the only people, by the way, whose competence is assessed three times a day by 130 people and the medic. And finally, transient workers, people who come to installation for a specific task, stay a few days, and then they're gone. I have a simple analogy here. Before I talk about it, I'll just say 26%. 26% of the people on a Chevron-operated installation are paid by Chevron. And again, that is significant. Because don't ever think that when you're doing your work, everybody is a company employee. 26%. Offshore family. I've said before that I'm like a mother to these boys. We are really trying to develop this culture of care, and you can't get more care than, the, than based on the family. So, in essence, the Chevron employees are my natural children. They are the people that have been born into the family. The grandparents live in San Francisco. They've got a big history there. So, they know the family values. They know the standards that their old mother expects. They know what to expect if they deviate from those standards. Core contractors. The core contractors are my adopted children. These are people who have been working on the same installation for years, trip in, trip out. They've lived with the family for so long that they know the values, they know the standards, and they apply them. The third group, the transit workers, they are like my foster children. They arrive, they stay for a few days, and they are gone. Some of them may have come from broken homes. I do not know. I do not know who and what has molded them before they arrive with me. This is one of my biggest challenges. So, OIM's induction. I meet every green heart that comes on board my installation, everyone. And we sit and we talk, sometimes in groups, sometimes singly, depends how they arrive. By the time they come to see me, their heads are spinning because they have received an induction, they've been out looking at where their lifeboat is, muster stations and so on. So we sit down and relax, have a cup of tea. 
we introduce each other. And have a chat generally. And then I tell them about the things that they must remember today and the other things that are less as important that they can pick up tomorrow. We talk about, uh, specifically, up there, do it safely or not at all, there's always time to do it right. Those are the key principles of how we do our business. And I assure them that this is not some bland corporate statement. This is a contract between me, the person who wants work done, and those guys that are going to do that work. It's a contract. The key principles are part of our uh, the tenets of operation, which are a code of conduct used as a tool to guide daily decisions. And it's brilliant for planning your work, executing your work. We also use the tenants to look back on what has failed, what has broken down, what part of the system. So that's the first time I introduced the concept of contract, and it's very important to me to get this through. Stop work authority. In fact, it's both on this handy wee card, the, all of these cards. And uh, that's Brenda Dulaney there, who's my boss's boss's boss. She's the president and CEO of, uh, the managing director of uh, Chevron Upstream Europe. And she's put her name to the Stop Work Authority. First of all, ask the guys, are you conversant with the notion? And usually they say yes. So we talk about Stop Work Authority. Have you ever exercised it? Has anybody ever stopped your work? Do you realize that you can stop the work at any time, even before the actual work has started? The other thing is that a lot of people associate it with third party work. But you should be thinking all the time about your own work. If you've got a plan, and we all need plans, and the plan should go like this, and it starts to go like that, try not to get sucked into the deviation. Stop the work. Realign, reassess, back on track, away you go again. And again, that's a contract. It's not a choice, it's a responsibility. So do it safely or not at all. Always time to do it right. Stop work authority. And all this in a framework of respect. There is zero tolerance for abuse. So... <clears throat> The other thing that I tell them uh, towards the end of the induction, which is only maybe 10 minutes, any questions? So they will ask questions, I will answer them. What else can I tell you that's really important? Oh yeah, never trust anything an OIM tells you in an induction, right? These guys have been everywhere in the North Sea. So you can see them. In fact, there's a whole gamut, a whole range. There's a young guy there, it's day one. There's a guy there who's been doing it for 30 years, seen it all, done it all. So I qualify that by saying, go and find out what the people think about my belief in do it safely or not at all, always time to do it right, stop work authority, see if we practice what we preach. And also tell them that uh, when it's time for you to leave this platform, if you feel like it, come and see the OIM, whoever's in the office, and answer one question, honestly, yes or no. And it's would you choose to come back here to work? And I'm not saying they all come back, but I've never had anybody who comes back and says, no, I wouldn't. I've had plenty of people that say, good place, good people. So, it's a good record. Control of work, we're all there to work. And basically, I'd like to talk very briefly about uh, two ways. Work is always controlled by procedures. There should be some demonstrable control way before any, any tools are picked up, way before the work started. So, there's a couple here qualified standard operating procedures. Everybody in this room has got a procedural compliance problem of some sort, some extent. Our standard operating procedures were uh, largely unused. There were informal processes on the go. There were people teaching each other how to do things. If you had five shifts, you would find five different ways of how to go about the same task. So we gathered all this together, looked at the critical parts that we had to do, the critical jobs, and we divide the standard uh, operating procedure, qualified standard operating procedure, where it is generated by the people who do the work with the assistance of a technical writer. It is vetted by the team leader of those people. It is vetted again by the technical authority and is endorsed and authorized by the OIM. So these procedures don't reside on the shelf. They reside in people's hands when they go to the job. And they can be changed very, very quickly. So the review on these procedures is every time they do the job. So they contain a lot of things. Why you're doing the job, 
how to do the job, risk assessments, and any other information that you need. So, very good tools. Permit to work. This is one of my favourites. We use ISSOW, which is a proprietary system. I believe about 80% of the North Sea uses ISSOW. Standardisation is great. Unfortunately, there are a number of uh, features that this electronic permit to work system has, pardon me, that can be used for either good or evil purposes. Yep. Cutting and pasting, not thinking. And I keep making the point to people that it's an electronic system, it's not an automatic system, it doesn't know what you are thinking, right? It just makes it quicker to get the process underway. Far too many people have still got this mechanistic uh, attitude towards permit to work. They see it as an impediment, hurdles to, to jump before you can pick up the spanners. More people need to see the value in this as a contract again. Everything to me is about contracts. This side of the desk wants the work done, that side is going to do it, this is how it's going to be done, that's the contract. And nobody does anything until everybody's satisfied that it's the right way to do it. So, permit to work, it starts with why we're doing the job, planning in the job, the preparation, the coordination, the execution, and the closeout. And going back to how remote the OIM was in the old days, I authorise every single permit that goes out on the installation every day. I also authorise every single operational risk assessment and every single safety critical risk assessment. So, times have changed. I hope I've given you little bits to think about. It's very difficult opening a conference like this. I feel like the sort of warm-up act for far more serious things that are going to happen next. But I would like to end up with basically an advert for step change in safety. Step change in safety is, is trying to do for the industry what we try to do locally. It realises that leadership, especially for transient workers, needs to be up there, sort of highest common denominator. Step change do so much excellent work, and a lot of that work goes unread. The work they did on personal responsibility for safety. The most successful work they've done today is in human factors for steps. There's human factors, next steps coming out shortly, and there's also a huge initiative called Joined Up Thinking that links everything together. Far too much work in the past, far too much we, what we do is compartmentalised. So I would advocate that everybody looks on the website and uh, takes in Joined Up Thinking. That was a little bit rushed, but right now, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.